Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So today is our pleasure to have Chris McIntosh uh, from British Columbia and he will talk to us about energy functionals in medical image segmentation. Thank you. Hello. Oh, is the mic working? Is, yeah, okay. So um, I'm going to talk about energy fi functionals in medical image segmentation. And specifically, I'm going to focus on the choices and consequences of the different uh, well, the consequences of the choices, basically, that people have uh, or encounter. So I'll start with a brief overview of medical image analysis for those who aren't overly familiar with the subject. And then I'll give kind of some background on um, energy minimization-driven segmentation. And then I'll move into the sort of depth of the talk. So medical imaging enables clinicians to examine anatomy in vivo. So without actually extracting somebody's lungs or spleen or what have you, we can examine its size, curvature, these sorts of features. And some of the major areas for computer science and electrical engineering are data visualization, image segmentation, computer assisted diagnosis, and disease understanding. And I'll kind of show you some examples of each of these in the next few slides, some published work that we've done um, in these areas. And just uh, as I'm going to talk about both 2D and 3D images, but a lot of 2D, I'll just define some basic terms. So when an image is acquired, you can view or when you're analyzing a 2D slice of that image, it'll happen in one of three planes. Sagittal plane is a plane straight down the body. It can be shifted off of the middle of the body, but basically straight down. Um, axial or transverse plane going across, and a coronal, which is going from the side. So what this might look like, for example, here we have a three-dimensional volume rendering of a human brain. And here we're visualizing a magnetic, magnetic resonance image, um, and it's a 2D slice, a mid-sagittal slice, so sagittal right down the middle and mid in the middle. And basically this organ that we see in the center is the corpus callosum, which is uh, frequently studied for disease progression, neurological disorders, multiple sclerosis, these sorts of things. And as this is a magne magnetic resonance image, basically instead of having a color value or something like that at each pixel or voxel, what we basically have is the amount of time it took that particular molecule in a patient to restore back to its sort of uh, alignment with a magnetic field. So basically, a patient's put in a very large magnetic field. All of the molecules in the body then begin spinning in direction with the field. The person's hit with a radio frequency pulse, pushes all of those things off of alignment, then takes them a few seconds to get back. And the amount of time it takes for them to get back into alignment with the field varies for different tissues. And so different tissues appear differently. So to a clinician, there's a lot of meaning for one tissue being bright and another tissue being dark. However, that's something that's kind of easy to interpret. It's just a scalar image. We can visualize that quite simply. But what if there's a lot more information at each pixel or voxel in the image? So we have something called uh, PET, or positron emission to tomography. And what happens here is the patient is in basically injected with a radioactive isotope that goes to their body and then a few minutes later begins emitting a small amount of radiation. So the person's put in a large imaging device and at, at that point what happens is you record the photon activity at each location in the body over time. The problem with doing so of course is now you've got each voxel is a different function. And so if you just visualize something like this for three different voxels we have three different functions but it's not very intuitive. There's no spatial information here. We don't know the ordering of the voxels. So this is the imaging device that people would actually go into. And what we see, what's often done, is we visualize the last frame of the sequence. So we might record for 26 seconds, but then the doctor only looks at the 26th second. And of course, many different functions can have exactly the same value at the end, and therefore it could indicate different physiology. Similarly, in this kind of close-up, what we see is they actually sometimes also visualize a sum over time of the function. And as we all know, of course, it's not, as, again, not a unique measurement. Lots of different functions can have the exact same sum. And so we're here we're not really getting an, a proper idea of the variability in the image, the physiological variability. 
So what we published um, in TMI this year is basically a method to visualize the data but to respect the underlying variability. And so what we can visualize here is actually a mapping from the function, the space of those possible functions to a human um, uniform perceptual space, lab color space. And so here, the difference between red and green, what a human perceives that to be a very different, two very different colors, and those correspond to very different functions in the high dimensional space. So a lot more information is presented very quickly to a clinician. Similarly, for diffusion tensor imaging, we're basically we're looking at the diffusion of a water molecule at a particular lo location in the human body. It's often the case that they visualize just these simple scalar fields that are basically combinations of the eigenvectors of a tensor. And we don't need to get into the specifics, but again, instead, we can actually visualize a color representation that gives a much better understanding of the underlying physiologi physi physiolog physiological variation and therefore a better understanding of what's happening. And similarly, if we zoom in, in this case, there's actually a tumor here in blue. And the tumor is visible in the original visualization, but the variation within the tumor itself isn't. It's all just this kind of dark mass. If we look at a color visualization, we can see that there's actually some of it's red, some of it's blue. So there is some different parts of the tumor do actually diffuse differently. And this may not mean a lot to us, but to a doctor, it will. Yes, how, sorry. How is this different than um, visualizing FA, the first uh, magnitude of the first eigenvalue? So this actually is FA um, on the left. Uh, what people often do is they visualize these things are called tensor glyphs. Mm -hmm. And so there's these sort of um, rendered 3D ellipses, and the colors are just RGB. So at that point, when you have red and green, it could be the case that actually the red and green are just as close in tensor space as two different red tensors, which doesn't make sense. So here what we've done is actually use the geodesic distances between the tensors to map to the lab space where those distances now have visual meaning to people. So now instead of looking at a color where you need this sort of color chart beside it and all these other things and you really have no intuitive understanding of what's happening here, if two things look very different, it's because they're actually very different. Is this so the distance between each pair of points? Um, yeah, between any pair, any two pair, or any pair of points, the distance maximally reflects the original distance in the six-dimensional space. So we use. Um, What's the tensorial Yeah, pardon? Is it tensorial difference? Yes. Oh. Yeah, I think we use log Euclidean for the distance metric. Oh. I mean, you could plug in any of the proposed geodesic tensor distance metrics. So that was. Uh, this uh, TMI example in data visualization. So if we move into image segmentation, we can give a 2D example. So again, we're mid-sagittal MR, and we can segment, in this case, the corpus callosum, so we can delineate it from the rest of the image. Now what this can be used for um, is computer-assisted diagnosis. So here, a patient basically can go in for medical exam. They might complain that they have severe headaches and nausea. They can get an image acquired and then we can use computer-assisted techniques to actually highlight areas of the vasculature that have low blood flow. So in this case, we have you know, this arrow pointing here to this thinning of the vessel. So the doctor or the radiologist can then go in and quickly visualize areas with low blood flow and go, okay, well, that's actually too low for that region. We think that some of the blood's being cut off. They can then go in and perform a surgical procedure or perhaps treat with drugs, you know, whatever they feel is the best course of action, and restore proper blood flow. We can also use these kind of techniques for disease understanding. So on the left, we have a spinal cord image. So again, mid-sagittal MR, but right down through kind of the neck and the top of the chest. And in the center, this white object is the spinal cord, and it sits in the spinal canal. And you notice in this healthy subject, it basically fills the canal entirely. However, in advanced progressions of multiple sclerosis, it's known that the spinal cord shrinks considerably. And that shrinkage actually correlates with the person's disability. So in this case, we notice a very large gap between the spinal cord and the near, nearby vertebra. So what we can do is use computer, assisted, or computer image segmentation methods to segment these, analyze their volume, and then track the atrophy of a person's spinal cord over time and gain a better understanding of how multiple sclerosis works. Because this is still... It's a very insidious disease, and it, there's a lot of research going into trying to figure out really how it affects people. And so in this work published in uh, Mackay and, and a recent HISB paper, 
Basically, what we've done is compare it to state-of-the-art, and state-of-the-art has 97% accuracy, which is great, but it takes 30 minutes per volume for a radiologist. Now, radiologists are, well, they're well-paid people. They're very well-trained, and they make a lot of money per hour, so it's very expensive to have a radiologist go through for a large study of thousands of patients and segment all of these images in 3D. Our method, by comparison, has 93% accuracy, volume accuracy, which is very, very close. However, it takes a mere minute of the radiologist's time. So basically, it's a factor of 30 reduction in cost to the end user, which is really the goal here. So when we look... So yeah. this is... Can you, can you go back? Yes. So this is interactive segmentation... Yes. ...of 3D volumes... Yes. ...of what? Of the spinal cord. Okay. And what form does the interaction take? Ah, so... Um, I can actually, I probably have a video somewhere on my hard drive that I can show you afterwards uh, if there's time. But basically, what the user does at this point is they provide two landmark points. So the, basically the vertebral range that they want to study. So if we go back here, um, basically the vertebrae are numbered from C1 all the way down to in the T range. And a lot of times they usually study the top few vertebrae. So in our method, the radiologist will click the vertebral range that they want to study, so say C1 and C7, and then they pr be presented with a two-dimensional orthogonal slice that they can click the center point in the cord, and then now we have basically our initialization to our method. Um, they also provide an estimate of the radius of the cord at the start as well. So all of that's done within about a minute of interaction time. Basically, the radiologist just slicing through to the middle of the volume, clicking a few points, moving very quickly, and then the method goes and does a fully automatic segmentation afterwards. So, yeah, so this is basically uh, semi-automatic segmentation, but the idea here was not to take the radiologist out of the loop, rather just to vastly improve their workflow, which they do like because they're paid on the number of images they can get through in an hour. So, really what uh, computer-assisted diagnosis and medical image analysis is about is about us understanding the end user. So we're not trying to replace radiologists. They are experts. They've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of medical images. They understand far more about physiology than we ever can hope to dream. But it's about time. It's about making their jobs much more efficient so that patients can be better diagnosed, faster diagnosed, more patients, larger studies. And so with visualization, one of our main goals really is to make the region of interest more obvious to the doctor. They don't have to spend 20 minutes looking at the volume. It's there. It's highlighted in red. It's very quick and easy for them. Point them to the interesting data with computer-assisted diagnosis again, so highlighting arrows pointing to what they need to see. Extracting interesting data faster for disease understanding, so giving them volume measurements without them having to sit down and actually physically measure the volume time and time again for case after case. So that's kind of the um, outline of medical image analysis. And I'm going to give a brief intro into energy minimization driven segmentation. So that's the type of segmentation that I'm going to focus on uh, in today's talk. So some basic terminology, we have a shape model, which is a function that represents a shape. Changing the parameters of the function changes the shape. So for example, we can have a simple circle with a dependent parameter, r the radius. Changing r changes the radius of the circle, thereby changing the shape in a basic sense. Um, an energy functional is then a scalar function that evaluates how well the shape model fits the data. The best shape will be the one that minimizes this function, or maximizes in some applications, but for the most part we'll talk about minimization. So for example, we can try to find the darkest boundary in this image. And we can define an energy functional, and we can see that for a very small circle in a very bright region, the energy is very, very high. Again, large circle, but bright region, very high energy. But for these two dark boundaries, there's two local, or one local and one global optimum corresponding to the slightly darker boundaries in the image. And our goal in an image segmentation task would be to find this global optimum. So energy minimization is typically carried out as a weighted combination of different features or different terms that the segmentation is thought to exhibit. So for example, you have an energy function defined as a function of the shape model and the image. So you can have a boundary term. Very commonly, this is actually comes in place as geodescactic contours. A uh, popular paper that's basically looking for the edges of an image. You have a region term, uh, which the, one of the most conical versions is the active contours without edges, the Chan and Vesey work. 
And that's looking at a homogeneous region of the image of a particular sort of mean and variation. And you can look at shapes. So you can say that you know, the object has some kind of known shape that you want to exploit. The weights are then attempting to balance the relative importance of these terms in the energy minimization procedure. And the segmentation is in the argmin of this energy functional, which typically takes place by equating the first variation of the energy functional with a dynamical time scheme. You can then perform things like gradient descent and you can change the shape over time and basically minimize the energy function and segment the image. And these are, in a large sense, I mean, these are called the formal models. Um, so. so for example, we can look at corpus callosum segmentation. As we talked about before, a lot of neurological disorders like multiple sclerosis affect the corpus callosum. And so it'd be nice to be able to segment and analyze the changes in shape that result as these diseases progress. So we can use prior knowledge to construct an energy functional. We might say that the CC usually has a strong boundary, so we're going to build in one of these edge terms. It's homogeneous, so we're going to build in a region term and has a particular shape, so we're going to build in some shape terms. And then we have this weighted combination. And the question is, will this work? Can we ship this to a radiologist or you know, a diagnostic lab? Can they segment thousands upon thousands of images and you know, do a disease study? Well. Each of those respective terms has their own inherent segmentation. So the boundary term basically has a minima. The region and the shape, they all have respective minimas in some high dimensional space. And the image that's, or sorry, the correct segmentation is also a minima in that space. And our goal then is to find the weights that actually cause this to occur. So what that means is if we get the weights wrong, we might over-segment the edges of the image and produce an erroneous result. We might over-segment the region, regional information, again, erroneous, or you know, we could actually get it right and get a very good segmentation. The problem, however, is that you know, typically some poor graduate student in some lab somewhere spends months trying to hand-tune all of these values and get this result. But they then go on to another image and it might kind of work, and another image and it might kind of work, and another image and it might kind of work. But the result is then shipped to the end user, and very quickly, they might find some images in their set or that are now newly acquired where the method doesn't work at all, where those weights simply don't address the variability in the image. And so the end user is then left trying to diagnose failure. It's great when these things work, but when they fail, why? And so it could be that the method is stuck in a local optimum, in which case we could use a different initialization or solver to get past this local optimum problem. It could be that there was a bad choice of weights, and so we need a different guess for what those weights should be. Or the energy function itself could just be inadequate. We're not measuring things that can really respect the variability in the data. And the question is then, can these results be improved? And if so, well, how? And so recent work is focused on convex functionals, a lot of recent work in the field, actually. And what these do is they approximate non-convex spaces with convex ones, for the most part. But there's a question, what's the cost in doing so? We gain global optimality, but do we lose some level of accuracy along the way? So this convex versus non-convex needs to be better explored. And the weights shouldn't be guessed. They should be optimized in you know, a rigorous fashion, not left up to the end user to just kind of hope they stumble across a good value. And what we're going to do is propose a solution to both issues. So basically, I'm going to move into kind of the, uh, the depth of the talk. And so we're going to first discuss a uh, recent uh, IEEE TMI paper on local minima and convexity in medical image segmentation. And then I'm going to go into um, some work on weight optimization that's been published in Mackay and is also being currently prepared for journal. So in local minima and convexity, what we're trying to do is address the diagnostic question. Does the initialization or solver, is, is that part of the problem? Do we need a different one? We're trying to avoid making convex approximations to non-convex data, and we're trying to improve deformable models. Specifically, what we're going to try to do is decompose non-convex def deformations into a linear space so they can be better studied. And we're going to try to replace the sensitive initialization sensitive gradient descent optimizer with a highly parallelizable local search, in this case, genetic algorithms. So, some terminology and kind of explanation of convex shape spaces. You can measure something called flexibility, which is the ability to fit any example of a target shape. 
We can also measure fidelity, which is our ability to resist fitting erroneous shapes. And then we have this question of convex versus non-convexity. So if we do a convex shape space here, and we have in blue, for example, we have all of the data points that we have in our training set. And we fit this convex shape space, so this ellipse to the data. Now we have very high flexibility. We can represent almost any blue point. But our fidelity is quite low, because we've also included in the shape space all of these red points. By trying to fit a convex structure to this non-convex space, by definition, we have to introduce all of these erroneous segmentations that we don't want. So to be convex or non-convex, we have this, sure, we've gained global optimality by moving to convexity, since these things are much easier to optimize, but we've lost fidelity. Instead, if we fit a non-convex shape space in gray here, we can see that we actually maintain all of the blue points. So we have perfect flexibility, but we haven't introduced this fidelity problem. Now the issue, of course, is that even a convex energy functional under a non-convex set of shape constraints is a non-convex optimization problem. And so we need a method to be able to optimize this. But first we're going to go into some kind of uh, just a bit more into the system bit more information about the deformations. So what's commonly done is something called active shape models. So given a training set of segmented images, we can characterize each shape by n points along its boundary. So in a 2D segmentation, this then becomes a single point in a 2n dimensional space. We can then perform standard PCA. And so we have x bar, a mean of the shape space, the eigenmodes, and the corresponding weights of the eigenmodes. So what does this look like? Okay, so we have here a simple ellipse in blue. We can deform the ellipse by bending it upwards. We can deform the ellipse by bending it downwards. And we get these three points along this nonlinear manifold. Now, expectedly, when we take the average, we get x bar. And this is what x bar looks like. And very clearly, this is not a point in the original space. It, it sits right here. It's not on the S. It's not a natural shape. This isn't an ellipse. It's some erroneous thing that we don't want as a resulting segmentation. So it's known, actually, that articulated motion in particular, so bending your finger or if a tumor pushes down on part of the anatomy and bends the anatomy, these sorts of deformations are non-convex. Therefore, linear statistics will reduce fidelity on those shape spaces. So we can look instead at something called a medial base shape representation. So instead of just targeting the boundary locations explicitly, what we can do is study these things called medial orientation profiles. And so we can look at a length profile. So for example, we have a set here of nodes, x1 all the way to n, along the medial axis, so along the center of a shape. The length profile then records the distance between each sequential medial node. So the distance from x1 to x2, x2 to x3, and so on and so forth. The orientation profile then records the orientational offset between each respective node. And the left and right thickness the distance on a, at a 90 degree angle from the 90 degree angle measured with respect to the medial axis from the medial axis to a boundary on the left and right side. So basically how thick the structure is. And using these profiles, we can then reconstruct a 2D or a three dimensional shape. So we're going to be able to segment images. We have a shape model, which are going to need an energy function. But first, let's look at the actual now our new shape statistics. So here then PCA becomes a function of the location that we actually recorded at, so a location along the medial axis, a scale, so how many nodes we do PCA over top of, and a profile, so whether we're studying the length, orientation, or thick left or right thickness profiles. We can then separate, so we can basically generate shape statistics for each profile. So here, the mean is then a mean for a particular profile, the dth profile here. And again, just the similar thing that we sum up over the modes of variation weighted by their weights. So we can now look again at this non-convex bending deformations. So we have our original point, we can bend it as before and get our two more samples. Now we, knew our, we know our linear mean was very bad, but instead we notice that this deformation actually really only affects the orientation profile. None of the other three profiles are modified at all to produce these shape changes. We basically just bent the medial axis. And so as it turns out, that's actually a linear deformation of that profile. So we've gone from this nonlinear space to this nice linear one. And of course, when we do linear statistics in a linear space, we get the right answer. We get the center point back. So we now have increased fidelity. We don't have an erroneous point introduced. 
this sounds like it's going to be perfect. Well, the problem is our original energy function, of course, is still defined in the image domain where these things were non-convex. So we didn't get anything for free. So our original energy function, especially once we add pose into the problem where we have you know, the angle of the model and its xy position within the image, is a non-convex optimization process. And basically here, just another visualization, we have the boundary in yellow and the medial axis of this corpus callosum in red. And here's the rasterized version, or but you know the binary representation of the shape would look like. So then we have this question of how to optimize. We have localized statistical deformations, and we've we've you know decomposed these non-convex deformations into convex ones. But we still need to minimize arbitrary cost functions, and we need to address the initialization problems that typically plague deformable models. So where the user has to initialize them somewhere in the data. Now, our solution then is to actually to use multiple initializations. So basically, instead of just focusing on one point, we can initialize the contours at many different points, optimize each of them, and instead we can get you know, a couple optima and we can take the best one, so the, which in this case is the global optimization. It's not guaranteed, but as we'll show in practice, we actually get pretty close. So we do this using genetic algorithms, which I won't give a lot of details on, but basically they're a special form of local search. A number of simultaneous initializations, which is typically deemed the population, is each, or each possesses an encoded state, which is the shape profile, so those weights of those modes of variation. We then perform a random walk, which is called a mutation, around the search space, and this is basically our optimization procedure. And this is in contrast to gradient descent, which in gradient descent, all of the initializations would always go downhill. In genetic algorithms, they actually just sort of step randomly. Um, so we can also form new solutions through combinations of existing ones through what's called a crossover operation. And what this allows for is this kind of survival of the fittest sort of thing, where we can dynamically reallocate the optimization resources over time. Well, that doesn't make sense just yet, but here on the next slide, it will. So, here what we've done is we've colored the, corpus, the potential segmentations according to the, how well they've optimized the energy functional. Green being the worst, red being the best. Uh, what we notice is the only thing even remotely close to red in this linear mapping is the one on the corpus callosum. So very quickly what will happen, even though the initialization was, uh, the population initially kind of uniformly spans the search space, they'll rapidly begin to converge on this one solution since it dominates the fitness. It's so much more powerful or strong than any of the other ones that very quickly the entire population will be centered on that one location. And what we see here is multiple, basically different sort of fit members going on and being optimized over time as they all rapidly converge on that location. Their segmentation error rapidly decreasing and the, the fittest, best model that does the best segmentation at the end is the one that's kept. Yes? I think these conclusions also depend on the fact that has a very distinct intensity value in the MR images. Do you think same conclusions will hold for other structures like Codate or, I don't know, hippocampus or something else? The question there is how you define distinct. So if you define, you know, distinct as bright, yes. Those, might, those regions, though they may be darker, they might have very strong textural characteristics. And all the method really would need at that point is something that makes it appear stronger under some set of filtering operations compared to its neighbors. And you would assume there is some kind of filtering or some kind of feature selection that would make that structure distinct. Yes, and if that didn't exist, then differentiating between the two structures from an algorithmic perspective would be a very hard task. But that's usually the problem people encounter in medical segmentation. Especially for the brain segmentation, we know the structures exist, while the gray levels or the intensity differences in MR images are not visible. Yeah. Uh, or they're not like very, very, very apparent. So the question then is they use shape models so that they can segment all these structures together without having such a great... Um, yes. And so that's kind of the point here. I mean, we not only need to find something that's bright, but it actually needs to be shaped like, the, like a corpus callosum. If there was something with exactly equal intensity but a circle sitting over here, then the method wouldn't actually stick to it. Now you see here this kind of brown one? That's actually because the skull has the exact same intensity profile in this case as the CC. So it's able to differentiate based on shape. So shape is just another feature, but as long as you have some feature in the space, whether it's shape-based or intensity-based or, you know, whatever it is, that can disambiguate the structure a bit, 
this is going to happen. If you had two corpus callosum in this image for some reason, and they had say, say they had the same response functions, what you would notice is that half the population would sit at each location until later on it found one of them actually fits the expected variation better. Does that answer your question? Okay. So our experimental setup is 51 corpus callosum images. And we're going to use five methods, but basically three energy functionals. So one of them is random walker. Um, this is by Leo Grady. It's a convex region-based method um, where the user provides a set of seeds. So it's a semi-interactive method or semi-automatic. And these seeds provide a constraint on the shape space. So they constrain the number of possible segmentations that can result of the energy minimization process. Um, we're going to look at geocuts, uh, which is by uh, Boykov and Kolmogorov or basically a convex boundary term, or so a convex method with a boundary term. So instead of region, this is boundary. And the seeds again exist and provide constraints on the shape space. And we'll look at this recent work, uh, well, CPR 2008 by Kremers et al. that basically is convex, has boundary, region, and shape terms. And then we're gonna examine this comparison to our proposed method, um, genetic algorithm HRPCA, and we're gonna average this across 24 runs per image since genetic algorithms are somewhat randomized. Yes. So basically, you sh you said that each uh, element in the population basically represents a shape. Uh, a possible segmentation. Yes. A possible segmentation, and then when you make moves, uh, basically your mutation moves or your cr crossover moves, you are basically doing uh, a search. Yes. And what are the steps in that search? So genetic algorithms typically use no, a... I mean, uh, I mean, what is the exact m manipulation to the shape that you're making? Oh, yeah. Um, the, the mutation and crossover operators. I actually had a slide on that, but I took it out. Um, but basically, we're modifying alpha. Mm -hmm. And we're modifying the pose components. So we can encode the pose components, so you know the rotation, the angular position, those sorts of things. And we can encode alpha as just a set of you know, floats. And then we can modify the position and the alpha. And doing so will change the shape. So what we see in this example is the pose being optimized over. Mm -hmm. And then here we see the shape actually changing as those components of the shape space are modified. OK, so the next question is that if you take a conventional approach where you discretize the values of alpha mm -hmm. and do an exhaustive search over the discretized alpha values, uh, and then basically do cost to find search yep. over alpha then, uh, what, how many, uh, how, would the convergence correct characteristics be the same and would uh, the more function evaluations be needed than the genetic algorithm scheme? Uh, I think certainly that um, more evaluations would likely be needed. Uh, the problem in doing that is we have about, off the top of my head, I think there's about 16 to 20,000 variables. Mm -hmm. By the time you go across all the different scales and profiles and locations that the PCA is calculated at. Mm -hmm. So do an exhaustive search would be enormous. It would be very, very expensive. Um, we do something that's coarse to fine. Mm -hmm. So we start off only looking at sort of the global modes of PCA and get more and more fine as we go on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could do that with the exhaustive methods as well. Uh, but our hope with the genetic algorithms is by using this uh, principle where the fittest kind of start to dominate that instead of with the exhausted search as we would keep exploring the entire, like both edges of the shape space, mm -hmm. here we would rapidly begin to converge on a region that we felt was, likely had a good segmentation in it mm -hmm. and put you know, the bulk of our resources there, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this is the same intuition behind like, uh, like important sampling and... Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Sorry, can you just, 16,000 variables. Yes. Three for pose. Yep. How many in alpha? Uh, that's where the 16,000 or so comes in. 16,000 variables in alpha. Yes. 16,000 possible values of alpha. 16,000 variables in alpha. It sounds a bit high, I know. Um, and the, the reviewers of TMI did ask this. So I am prepared to answer your question. Basically, as we're summing over all the different profiles, so we have four different profiles, and then suppose we have 100 different medial nodes. So that gives us 100 different medial nodes to do PCA at and 100 different, well not 100 different scales, but you know, uh, at most 100 different scales for each node. So then as a result, at each of those locations, each of those scales, we end up with a different vector. Now what you'll, what you'll say to me of course is that, well if I have four profiles 
and 100 nodes per profile, really I have a max of 400 dimensional space, which is completely true. And so that does mean we've over-described the space. But the resulting modes of variation are still valid. So those modes of variation can be described by what you would do on the global PCA, if that's making sense, on these, by these 400 dimensional vectors. But you might be very unlikely as a consequence of the genetic algorithm to achieve those small localized variations. So what that means is if, in for example, uh, the corpus callosum here, if we wanted to suppose all of the corpus callosum, all of the shape model perfectly fit the data except for this one area, if we did globalized PCA where we just have the 400 variables, finding the linear combination of those variables that would move only this region would be very unlikely because it's a small bit of variance in the population and PCA preserves the larger modes of variance. However, if we have some modes that directly correspond to only that area, those modes can then be modified and we can get the desired deformation. We can show that this actually basically allows us to do this course defined search and speed up faster. It doesn't represent any new shapes. It's the same shape space. It's just been kind of overly decomposed to give us a better search. So let me just test that again. So you were saying uh, 16,000 alpha parameters. Yes. In a range, uh, so if I draw them from a 16,000 dimensional Gaussian. Yep. With diagonal covariance or? Yes. Uh, so I draw these alphas. I will always get a shape in the family. Yes. Right. Because at the end, what you're doing, the, when you add up, uh, where's that equation? When you add up here, you're always back in that 400 dimensional space. And you can actually, you can show that some set of what, we'll, what we call global PCA variables, so PCA variables that are actually of 100, vectors of a length 100 instead of just you know, length 10, um, some set of those vectors can describe any shape space that these can describe. We just don't know what those vectors are. And what we likely end up with as a consequence of PCA on just the maximal scale is preserving these global deformations and ignoring the smaller ones. But if I look at a single column, M colon LS, yes. that should look like, does that look like corpus callosum? Or does uh, it look yes, like for L corpus? equals 1, for S equals 100, it would be the global modes of variation across the entire shape. For L equals 50, at which point the scale, the maximal value of the scale could be 50, so going all the way 50 points to the end of the model, if there's 100 uh, nodes on the medial axis, then changing the alpha for that, uh, for that setting would only, it would still be a valid corpus callosum, but it would only change one half of the corpus callosum. The rest wouldn't change. There may exist some mode of variation of length 100 that will change the entire shape but it's likely not been preserved by PCA. So is, your actually, is your goal here actually to create local PCAs or local deformations that can be independent from each other? So each yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and the, the reason to do that is because of the course defined search that we'll do. We kind of know that towards the end of the optimization process, let's go down here. Um, towards the end of the optimization process, we don't need to make large changes in the shape. Small localized shapes, shape changes are going to take care of these very small single pixel errors. If we keep making large shape changes the entire time, it's going to be un unlikely we can find the single mode of variation or the linear combination thereof that corresponds to just segmenting that one erroneous pixel. So at the beginning, we're only looking at the 400 dimensional space and we kind of begin expanding and expanding and expanding over time. And your crossover operator wouldn't work as well, right? Because the crossover operator assumes that uh, one part of one solution is good and the other part of the other solution is good and then you're trying to combine it, right? Exactly. Does that answer your guys' questions? I can certainly go into more detail later on. Um, the idea here was to give enough overview, at least to peak interest anyway. Um, so, are we weary? Right. Uh, so we, just a reminder, I guess, we had these methods, random walkers, geocuts, and they use seeds, so they're kind of interactive. And so what we see here is the seeding percentage, the amount of, the percentage of pixels in the image that have been seeded progressing from 0% to 10% and, you know, in theory beyond to 100%. At 100%, of course, the entire image would be, have been manually segmented by the user. So at 0%, the segmentations are bad. 
I mean, they're very bad. The shape space is not constrained, this convex shape space is not constrained enough to segment the image. What's interesting is that as we progress all the way to, you know, to 10% and certainly beyond, what we begin to notice is that what we've done is made specific shape constraints to each image. And we already know that in the limit, if these seeds were the segmentations, we know that's a non-convex space. So effectively, without even realizing it, what these methods are doing, even though you know, they're kind of promoting these convex optimization procedures, they're forcing the non-convex part onto the user. So the user, by providing seeds on a per-image basis, is enforcing a set of unknown non-convex shape constraints across the image set, which is crafty. So we're going to try to do that automatically instead of with a user. And so we can compare the flexibility and fidelity of these interactive convex methods to some automatic methods that are convex in our proposed approach as well. So with the interactive methods, we notice that the shape flexibility is perfect. Because the user is providing constraints, by definition, assuming you know an intelligent user, the constraints can segment any image that you know, the radiologist encounters. However, when the seed percentage is low, so when the shape spaces are actually convex, there's not a lot of interaction, the fidelity of the methods is also very, very low. So a lot of erroneous shapes have been introduced. However, when the non-convex constraints begin to kick in as the user enforces more and more non-convex constraints along the shape space, the fidelity does increase. So this is going to you know, motivate that actually these non-convex spaces are a good idea. Then when we study an automatic convex method, so this Kremers method with the standard you know, uh, linear PCA, we notice that the, fidel or, sorry, the flexibility is a bit lower. So in order to kind of keep the fidelity from being extremely low, we limit the number of modes of variation that are kept. So we, you know, we keep, for example, 92% of the variance. If we keep 92% of the variance, of course, we eliminate 8% of it, which gives us a lower flexibility, but raises our fidelity a bit. If we compare the Kremers method to this column, or this, yeah, column here, this is the exact same energy functional, same weights, everything, being optimized for each method. What we've basically done at this point then is replaced the convex PCA shape constraints being used in that technique with our genetic algorithm HRPCA shape constraints and of course the convex gradient descent with the genetic algorithm optimizer. And what we notice is actually we get, not only do we increase flexibility because of this basically, you know, we have a better shape space, but of course we also increase fidelity. So we're fitting this S to the letter S instead of this ellipse. So we have a lot less erroneous shapes introduced and we can see that the fidelity actually increases quite a bit without changing the energy functional at all. So we didn't find any more intelligent features to optimize over. We just put a better set of constraints on them. Similarly, we can compare using uh, geodesic active contours, which is exactly what GeoCuts is optimizing. So those are the same energy functionals. And again, if we compare to GeoCuts with a low seeding percentage, we see that we have a very large increase in the fidelity. Is this for the corpus callosum? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Fully automatic, though. How are the numbers calculated, the flexibility and the fidelity? Uh, so the flexibility is calculated, basically um, it varies per method. For these, it's, we don't even need to calculate it, it's obviously one. Um, for the automatic methods, what we do is, for example, for the Kremers, we can just project each method onto the shape space, or each, sorry, each segmentation onto the shape space and calculate the, responding, the corresponding error. And the same for the HRPCA. But, so we but the solution that the Kramer's algorithm might give you could be different for different parameters. You're saying you project the ground truth yes. segmentation okay. onto the yes. shape space. Yes, I see. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, we take the ground truth, project it on the shape space, and then we measure the error that results from that projection. Mm -hmm. For the fidelity, basically, the fidelity is an approximation. We can't measure the entire shape space, it's computationally infeasible, what we instead do is run the energy functionals through and then basically measure the error. So we assume at that point that we're, what we're basically getting is if the energy functional, the higher the error, the higher the energy functional can push the segmentation away from the ground truth. And so the larger that shape space is, you know, unnecess it's unnecessarily large in that regard. So it doesn't make sense to compare that, you know, for different energy functions, but from one energy function to the, you know, between Kremers and our method on the exact same energy function, then it is a good measure of fidelity. Because our method, the only difference really is that we've done a better job of constraining the shape space. So, yes? Uh, well, you 
calculate flexibility based on the ground truth? Yes. And the shape of that is also complete? No, there's no ground truth involved. We okay, just segment the image at that point. Okay. Yep, so that's a fully automatic segmentation. Um, basically, it would be one minus the segmentation error. So we can also look at the standard deviation. And the reason to do this is because genetic algorithms are a randomized op optimization method. And so you know, it's valid to ask, how likely is it that these will converge towards the data? Well, with the interactive methods, what we note is that the standard deviation is you know, fairly lower for higher seeds. What's interesting, though, is that with genetic algorithms, the standard deviation across a single image, so by running multiple genetic algorithms on a single image, is lower than the standard deviation introduced by running across images in the other methods. So what that means is, if we want to maximally reduce the variability and error that the end user receives, we don't need to go after the genetic algorithm. That's not responsible for much of the variation. What is responsible for the variation is the energy functionals. And so we get to this um, question of how to improve the energy functional. And so, so our... There's a question. So, yeah. so uh, what were the comparative, like how many function calls or how many gradient computations were needed for those three methods? Uh, I don't have the number of function calls. The run times uh, were basically... I think the GAH RPCA took about five minutes per image. Mm -hmm. um, Kremers would have been about a minute per image. Mm -hmm. uh, these methods would have been a few seconds, but with also a few minutes of user interaction. So we kind of, these are fully automatic, and so we don't really worry about it as much since it can go off to you know, a cloud-based mm -hmm. system and be analyzed. Mm -hmm. so before passing to the other section, I have another question. Mm -hmm. So there are, well, a large portion of this field actually works on train segmentation. Yes. And um, one of the very dominant approaches is atlas-based segmentation, which is done in the lab of Bruce Fischl, Polynegol, and David Seacoast, mm -hmm. and other places. And their approach is basically not to segment a single object, but multi objects. Yes. So then the question is how does your algorithm? can deal with multiple segmentation. And the second question is, how does these results correspond to that? That yeah, problem. The results of these groups? Uh, that's a, no, that's a valid question. Um, I think that it would be interesting to extend the experiments to those situations. We haven't done that. I mean, in theory, genetic algorithms would be extendable. You could now have different members of the population segmenting different organs and these sorts of things. But we haven't tested the idea. Just to by these uh, purpose segmentation were in 2D, right? Yes, these were 2D. Yep. And it's a 2D segmentation? Yes, these are 2D. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, in the, the, so your shape representation, I mean, the, especially the corpus callosum in 2D is a quite similar shape, like you have this banana yes. thing. So do you think this would be um, extendable to 3D and more complex shapes, for instance? Could you, would you think of replacing the, the standard approach of PCA for liver segmentation, for instance? Yeah, I think that um, actually the shape method has been tested. Um, I mean, Stephen Pizer's group works very heavily on medial-based shape representations for 3D anatomy. Um, and they've been able to show in those representations that those are superior to a lot of the boundary-based ones, similarly to we have here. Um, our method also does generalize to 3D for the shape representation. That's not a problem. Uh, the reason we actually picked the CC is, as you mentioned, it's not a very complex shape. And so that's what's so interesting. If the convex approximations to the shape spaces don't work for a simple shape, then they're going to work even worse for a more difficult shape. Our methods might also have problems, but clearly, I mean, they're going to have the larger problems, what we would expect. But if you have 16,000 variables right now in 2D, how many variables would you have in 3D? A lot more. But that's 16,000 at the very, very end of the optimization process. So at the beginning, we only have, you know, 30 or 40. But that is a valid point. I mean, we do need to generalize the methods up to those larger number of variables. Um, so basically, we kind of tried to address this con question of are convex approximation worth it, worth it? And we found that they weren't in the face of highly variable medical data. It was better to focus on more, more faithful representations with approximate solvers. And so this question, should fo future work focus on optimizers of energy functionals? Because of that low standard deviation, we feel really it should focus on energy functionals. And improving energy functionals would then pr provide the largest decrease in error. 
And the question is, how do we improve energy functionals in a general sense? And that's what we're going to deal with with the second part, with the weight optimization. And so I'm going to go kind of quickly here, I guess, because we're running out of time. Um, but basically, the problem reminder is that we had a number of different terms. If we change the weights in the wrong way, we get the wrong segmentations. The right weights give the right, right segmentations. And this happens on you know, a per image basis. So the weight optimization work is what we're going to talk about next. And basically, what we're going to try to do is address the diagnostic question of different weights or a new functional. And our hypothesis is that different images actually require different weights. And we're going to try to provide a method to automatically learn the weights for a given image segmentation pair, and then provide a method, given that, tr that training phase, automatically infer weights for novel images. Okay. So first I'm going to talk about learning the weights for a given image segmentation pair. So for a set of training data, we know that the corresponding images and segmentation lie on some high dimensional manifolds. And ideally, the energy functions are functions of those, or the energy functionals are functions of those manifolds. And for each corresponding pair, the ground truth, or sorry, the global optimum of the energy functional is the ground truth for the corresponding image. So this seems rather obvious, of course. And how do we get this though? We look at, you know, a very simple example or a specific example. So the first thing we're going to try to do is make sure that the solution SJ is a stationary point of the energy functional. And we do this by computing the weights W that cause the norm of the gradient at the ground truth segmentation to tend to zero, hence enforcing it be a stationary point. What we can also do is then cause the gradient, find the weights that cause the gradient in the neighborhood to point towards the solution. So try to get this convex bowl shape of the energy function. So if we initialize somewhere nearby the segmentation, the optimization procedure is then going to take us towards the ground truth. Now it turns out solving this is a convex optimization problem. It's actually a convex quadratic. The optimal weights are therefore guaranteed and it's very, very fast. It takes less than a second. The problem is we've kind of added two terms together and in doing so we've implicitly introduced a weight lambda that controls the trade-off between them. Our whole goal was to move away from weights and so we make the observation that for convex energy functionals, at least, what we can actually do is avoid the trade-off by setting the neighborhood to actually a hard constraint as opposed to a weighted optimization problem. And the only problem here is that we might get these very large basins of optimum, but we found in practice this wasn't actually the case. So I'm going to actually just skip this and because we're... Um, so what we're going to do is compare this to actually work from here, uh, Microsoft Research, uh, to the max margin technique. And so what this basically does is instead of trying to cause our heuristic, what they're going to do here is instead try to force the ground truth to have, in the minimization case, to have less energy than all possible other segmentations. And it's going to try to maximize the amount of energy, the amount of difference in energy. And Basically, this is set up as a soft margin optimization, some slack variables, we won't go into the details, but suffice it to say, solving for the weights finds the weights that cause the, ma the margin maximized. Um, so we can set up basically an energy functional. We're going to use the one from uh, Kremers et al, CPPR 2008. And basically, we have active contours without edges. So we have the region information with the corresponding weight that is now the, a function of the image I. We can have a geodesic active contour, so our boundary term and we can have some kind of shape prior. And then we have our three corresponding weights that we need to automatically set. And our data is a set of 470 affine registered mid-sagittal MRIs. So we're going to look at the CC again to kind of you know, keep consistent. So first what we're going to do is optimize a rigged energy functional. So what we're going to do is add a term that has zero segmentation error. And in theory, if the methods work, we'll get zero segmentation error. And of course, for our weight optimization procedure, what we do is actually end up with zero segmentation error, and intuitively the weights are all zero except for one for the very last weight, which is that perfect term. So what this means is if the, segmenta if the weights can be configured such that the ground truth is the optimum of the, of the optimization procedure, that will happen. And you can prove that this will happen. And similarly, you can do the same for max margin and same thing. But what about a real energy functional? So we take away that rig term. Here what we're doing is visualizing the two weight distributions. So the proposed method versus the max margin. And we do notice is that there is a distribution of weights. So intuitively this shows us that we 
really shouldn't fix the weights across all images. Each image does actually need its own optimal weight, since there is a variability in the optimal weight across the set of images. We just get two slightly different distributions for the two different methods. In terms of results, what we end up with is for max margin, we end up with an average error of about 0.16 across the data set. And with our method, we end up with about 0.1245, so a significant reduction. The big difference really though is the runtime. So max margin takes about 92 seconds per image based on the fact that it has to kind of dynamically establish the constraints over time and each constraint is found by basically segmenting the image. Our method doesn't do this and so it basically solves one convex quadratic instead of possibly hundreds and therefore takes about half a second per image. So it's a very significant speed up. Pardon? What is the error here? Oh, uh, the error is Jacquard. So it's 0.04 increase on Jacquard. Yeah. Um, so we can skip this. Uh, so now we're kind of left with this question of how to infer the weights for novel images. Um, and so basically, for novel images, now we know the optimum weights for I0 and I2, and we can then calculate the geodesic distance between images. We, so we have novel image IJ, we have known weights for I0, I2. We can then interpolate to infer the weights for IJ. So what this looks like as a sort of a segmentation technique is basically we can learn the geodesic distances for a set of training data. We can find their optimal weights. For novel image, we can find its nearby training images, use interpolation to get the optimal weights for that image, and then we can go ahead and minimize the energy and segment the image. I think I need to stop you there. Sure, of course. Uh, we have time for one question, quick one. Did this improve the reason? Yes. <laughs> the best, I mean, the really neat result here, basically, I mean, in blue, we have the weights from the training phase, and in red, we have the learned weights. So we can see that they actually do correspond. And what's really interesting, I mean, the sort of the take home message would actually be that our proposed method, our testing error, is lower than the training error with max margin. What was the testing error with max margin? So the testing error in max margin, we didn't even compute, because it would, for this 470 images, would have taken a very, very long time. Um, and what's actually, so it's interesting that the very small difference in error here means that only a very small amount of error was introduced by our interpolation method. The bulk of the error lies in the energy functional. So, yeah. Okay, I think we'll uh, stop here. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.